almost two thirds of the people on the planet live in this area, a majority of people. And so increasingly as they develop in their own way, Asia is going to be the cultural center and the leader of, of the planet. And so I go to Asia today still to capture the past and to see what the future is going to be because that's much more likely where most of that future is going to happen. Welcome to Deviate with Rolf Potts, where I talk with experts, public figures, and interesting people about fascinating topics that meander off topic. Today, my guest is Kevin Kelly, who co-founded Wired Magazine in 1993 and is one of the pioneers of how we've come to use internet technology. Tim Ferriss, who was my guest way back in episode one of this podcast, has called him, quote, one of the most interesting human beings I've ever met. And when most people see or read about Kevin Kelly, it's usually in contexts like this. Every time computers get more powerful, they basically threaten our established understanding of ourselves, both in terms of who we are or who we could be. If I have my computer doing something for me, is that an extension of myself? Is there really a self there? Is that just a, a bot? That's Kevin holding forth in a documentary about the science behind the movie The Matrix. Keanu Reeves himself has recounted that all the actors in that movie were required to read Kevin's book Out of Control before they could read the script. Around that same time, Kevin was one of a group of experts assembled by Steven Spielberg to envision what the year 2054 might look like in advance of shooting the movie Minority Report. Kevin Kelly is, in short, renowned for being a futurist of sorts, but I've always been more interested in him for something tied to his past specifically his travels in Asia in the 1970s. Kevin spent most of the 1970s wandering through countries like Japan and India and Afghanistan, and his book Asia Grace is a collection of his most exquisite photos from that time in his life. In short, back when I was still in preschool, Kevin Kelly was living the kind of vagabonding life that presaged my own travels in Asia 25 years later. I think most hardcore travelers are fascinated by the vagabonders who went before them and what it was like to travel in an earlier age, and in this episode, I really have Kevin break down the nitty-gritty of vagabonding life in the 1970s. In fact, we get into so much detail that this ends up being one of the longer deviate episodes I've done this season. I was fascinated by how Asia was different back then, of course, but also by the fact that the very tools that were fading away when I started traveling on my own in the 1990s, things like traveler's checks and aerograms and poste restante, were a big part of how he traveled in the 1970s. In a sense, Kevin paints a picture of a lost world of sorts, a time capsule of what Asian travel was like in the days before credit cards and internet communication. What's telling is that, all technology aside, the basic act of travel and personal discovery in faraway places is pretty much the same as it's always been if you travel slowly enough. And the golden age of travel is always right now because really right now is all that we have. I've included a ton of information about Kevin Kelly and his travels in the show notes at rolfpotts.com slash deviate, including his Asia travel books and his new Recommendo newsletter, which features brief recommendations of cool things that can enhance your life. Kevin and I talked by Skype, and the interview kicks in just after we've compared notes on what it's like to travel with no luggage. Let's listen in. Well, anyway, are we ready to roll? Yeah, let's do it. In fact, this okay. ties right into my subject matter, which is my fascination with your Asia travels in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. uh, because as a traveler who's been around for a while now, I'm in my late 40s, I sometimes hear from younger travelers who, for whatever reason, have idealized the travel conditions that I started with in the 1990s, which feels strange because as a traveler of the 1990s, I idealized the very conditions you traveled in. Uh, in the 1970s and sort of saw it as a purer time in the same way that that uh, young travelers these days might see the 1990s as a purer time of travel in the sense in the sense that they it was a sort of a dial up pre social media pre smartphone time of uh, of travel whereas yours was was pre pre all of this and and I've heard you describe your settings as as sort of uh 
connected to more medieval ways of life than to globalized ways of life. So I'd really like to hear about the nitty gritty of how you traveled in the 1970s. So I guess I'll start with what inspired this trip? Why, why Asia and not uh, South America, where a lot of Americans might go, or Europe, where even more Americans might go at a young age? Yeah, it's a great question. So, so the 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 starting point um, is actually very difficult to convey, and I have the same challenge in trying to talk to my kids about it. Um, when I grew up in New Jersey in the '60s, I was going to high school in the '60s. Um, compared to now, it was a unbelievably parochial, closed-off place. Um, there was no sense of it being international. I mean, uh, eating out was very much an American palate. There was uh, I never I never had Chinese food in my life. Uh, I didn't never held chopsticks, um, and so um, the closest we come with is reading National Geographic about these exotic places, uh, and I. Um, knew a friend of my father's who was from the army who had gone to Japan. He was the, on the first boat of people to land in Japan after the surrender. And um, he was a short Jewish guy from New York City, and he fell in love with Japan and eventually started to work in Japan and would come back with these tales we're sitting in our you know little living room in the New Jersey suburbs, and I was hearing about these amazing stories of like Japanese baseball and um, just the weirdness of Japan. And so I had a I had an interest from from that. It was like, well, that's weird. Here's I actually met somebody who had been in a different place, and um, but I never kind of really ever expected or even dreamed of going there. Um, and then step two was I became interested in photography in high school. Uh, I was kind of a science nerd, but also had an artistic interest. And photography was this uh, beautiful convergence of art and technology. Because at the time in the 60s, the only way to do photography yourself was to print, you know, to go into the dark room and do the chemicals. And that's what photography meant at that time. It was very kind of um, esoteric in a sense that you, there was a lot of information you had to know. And using cameras was, they were not automatic. So you had to learn the system. And it was, um, it was, you know, the AV guys. They were, they were, they were kind of the classic geeks, and um, and so I became really interested in photography. And I was doing large format, black and white, spending a lot of time in the dark room. Um, and um, the third component of that was um, after we graduated from high school, my best friend in high school um, wanted to become a missionary to China, and he went to Taiwan to study Chinese. Um, the fourth uh, uh, vector in this long answer to your question is that I um, was in my first year of college um, and I was completely um, disgruntled about it. And instead of um, studying for exams, I was reading books and I dropped out and then spent the next year on the beach in Narragansett reading one book a day, reading through the great books. And I happened to read Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, which, as I was reading it, which is this sort of ode to travel in America, this, this kind of this um, exuberant um, poem about the variety and diversity of the America. And, and it was very photographic in its depictions of, <clears throat> you know, guys on the longshore hauling loading things and the farmer and and I and I reading it, I just was suddenly seized by this impulse to travel I, which I never had before it was just suddenly just came over me I was like I have to see this and at that moment my friend in Taiwan wrote to me and said you know um, I'm not gonna be here very long when you come over while I'm here and I can show you around Taiwan and that kind of 
meshed with my sudden desire to travel, and I had concocted a plan to go photograph, um, to take pictures in Taiwan and then Japan because it was so close. And my father's friend had inter- had said something about visiting a friend of his in Japan who was, was a, a a widow, a lady who lived by herself in Osaka, and I could stay with her. So suddenly I had a plan, which was to go to um, Taiwan and Japan and photograph. And that's all I knew. I mean, I didn't know anything about this. I'd never been out of the New England. I was, it was, you know, it was 1970, 1970 or so when I concocted this plan. And um, I, I knew nothing. I mean, like, I, I tried to go to the bookstore to get um, books about this, guidebooks. There was, there was photos, which was like very... I mean, it was like talking to people who had a lot of money. I didn't have any money. Um, I'd heard about hippies traveling in Europe, so I knew nothing. And um, all I had were two contacts, a friend in Taiwan and a friend's friends in um, Osaka, Japan. I never met anybody who had ever traveled there besides my father's friend. I didn't know that you could travel. I thought that you needed to be invited to a country to get there, you know? Um, so anyway, so, so the, the state of information was low. There was no internet. The libraries were unhelpful. They didn't have much. Um, so I'm just kind of painting a picture that this was really unknown territory and doing it was, um, I did it kind of blindly because there just wasn't much information. The, the one other little thing I did do is uh, I was sort of getting this idea that maybe I should be a National Geographic photographer. So I actually called up National Geographic and said, you know, I asked for the photo editor. I, I looked in the magazine and said I got a name and I said I want to talk to the photo editor and I called the guy up. His name was Bruce McElfish. I still remember it. And I said, I'm – going to go to Taiwan and Japan to photograph. I'm just a, you know, I'm a kid, you know, do you, what do you need? I mean, can I, can I, can I photograph for you? And the guy said, you know, that's not how it works, but when you come back, um, show me your photographs and we'll, we'll see if there's another step. And that was actually true to his word. I mean, I, I actually did that. Um, so I was kind of imagining this thing as a place where I was going to kind of photograph for National Geographic. This is in my mind. Um, and, um, I left and I went off to Asia because basically because I had some contacts. It was, uh, perhaps if I had contacts from people who were living in a different part of the world, I would have wound up there, but I went to Asia because, there was something that I had contacts with, and from the moment I landed in Hong Kong, which is where the my flight took me to, it was like I, my mind was blown. It was it was just it was like going to another planet, and I was, you know, I was captured. I was smitten. Well, I want to get into the details of what you found there and and really how you got around because it it feels like it's this pre guidebook era. It's it's an era when the the Tony and Maureen Wheelers, who eventually uh, created Lonely Planet, were doing the same thing as you, uh, and the Hillary Bratz, who created Brat Guides, and and Bill Wheeler, who created Moon Guides, uh, were not yet uh, making books. And so I want to know the specific, specifics of that, but I just wanted to sort of echo how interesting it is that military people and missionaries sort of informed your uh picture of Asia, because the same thing happened to me. I think it's sort of a bygone era when we can just type in keywords and learn all sorts of information and find uh, stories from other travelers who've been to those parts of the world. Um, But uh, I remember missionaries coming to to my Lutheran church in Kansas and talking about places like Ghana or Taiwan. And in fact, both of my pastors, who were sort of these cerebral guys with um, Germanic uh, surnames, had, had also trained in Taiwan specifically, that they were fluent in Chinese and had done their missionary work in Taiwan. And so it's, it's interesting how evocative uh, this is of a much earlier time. And actually, not to get ahead of myself too much, but you mentioned National Geographic and the book that came out of this uh, experience years later, Asia Grace, 
I thought uh, while looking at those pictures, they have a really National Geographic sensibility. But let's go back to this moment in Hong Kong uh, and talk about how you, you got around. I mean, you had a contact in Taiwan. You had a contact in uh, Japan. How did you figure things out? How did you deal with language? How did you find hotels back in this time when really you didn't have a little recipe plan to, to, to travel by? Yeah, it, you know, thinking back on it, it was sort of remarkable. I want to just fast forward to just as an example. Once I was in Taiwan, um, I, I came across a couple other travelers who um, had also kind of discovered the secret world. And so I was in Taiwan, which was very frustrating because Taiwan at that time had – almost no English translation anywhere. I mean, this is in the early 70s. It was not far uh, away from the, the you know, from, from China's um, being run by China. And so um, it was very frustrating for me uh, as someone who didn't speak Chinese or read Chinese, just finding hotels because they weren't, they weren't late. There was no, there was no signs. And so I was trying to learn this character for, for hotel, and in fact, there was very few hotels in Taiwan. There were a few business hotels, and a lot of them wouldn't even. I would walk in, and they were I'm not even sure if this was a hotel or not because the character was there was more than one character, and they were kind of just they were like I don't know you would there were they weren't they didn't look like hotels. They were just like another garage door on the street, and. Um, they often wouldn't take foreigners. And so finding a place to sleep was actually a big deal for me as I was tra traveling around because there were very few of them, just even identifying them, um, and then getting finding one that would accept me um, was, was, was a, a problem. But I did encounter two Swiss guys who were traveling and um, – they were they were describing uh, in Taiwan just randomly or somewhere or I, we randomly came across there were very few tourists at the time, um, and they were describing their recent adventures going through Indonesia and India and I, and and I was saying wait 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 I mean you can go to India you just you just go there I mean you just buy a ticket and go, and they said yeah you just you just go there and and I will. You know, the same question you have. Well, how do you get around? I mean, what's the, how do you know where to go? And they said, you just go and ask around. And, and they were saying they had just come from the Philippines and they were raving about it because you could get by with English in the Philippines because of the U.S. kind of um, occupation. And they said, it's just, you know, it's just a couple hours away by flight. The flights are really cheap. And they should, you should go. And I thought, I guess I should go. So I wanted to take a break from um, this kind of struggle with China, getting around in, in Taiwan because of the language barrier. So I actually bought a ticket to the Philippines, and like you know, like a week later, it was very cheap. And I got on the plane, and when I got on the plane, I had zero information. I had no contacts. I had no addresses. I had I didn't know anything about the country. I remember sitting. There was a little map in the back of the seat. And I said, oh, there's a lot of islands down here. And I arrived in Manila at the airport, and I literally had nothing. I mean, I didn't even know where to go. I didn't know anybody. And there was families um, meeting other people at the airport. And one of them, you know, threw a little garland of flowers around me, and I, and I was saying, like, I just arrived. Are there hotels in Manila? Where, where should I go? And I, I mean, I had nothing, no, not a single scrap of advance guidance. Um, and I would, you know, I kind of, I said, well, how do I get into town? And they say, take a jeepney. So I went into jeepney. I'm walking around asking, you know, are there hotels? Where's the hotel? And I just would get a map and kind of, Try to figure out, well, there's a ferry here. What time do the ferries go? And, and drive into place. And there would be the same questions. Um, where could I stay? Where Where is a hotel? So um, the absence of information is sort of sounds almost unbelievable to us now. 
But that really was the state. And the solution was just to ask. That's easier in a place where they speak English. Asking in places like Taiwan was uh, it was frustrating. It was it was it was work. It was there was a kind of a, a little bit of an anxiety of every day of like, will I be able to find a place? Um, will I be able to communicate that? And so you know, I would learn, try to learn the characters and write them down, and I would walk down, looking at the signs, each sign, trying to see if um, I could figure out. Um, where that was. Later on, in other parts of the world where the British had a presence, you could find, there was a little bit more of a, a easier to translate thing. I'm talking about like India, Burma, places like that. Um, it, was a, it was a lot easier, but in um, Japan, um, that was, it was a, a constant struggle to, to kind of find things. Now, I would imagine like a much bigger percentage of your day was spent solving these problems. Uh, you know, backpackers yeah. these days can just pre-advance their hotels. You know, signs are in English. Right, right. Money, money exchange. Like one example is uh, how did you approach money in these places? What did yeah, you carry yeah. with you? So the first time around, uh, the, the standard advice for most travelers was that you did traveler's checks. And... Then to cash a traveler's checks, you had to go to a bank, and not just a bank, but you had to, there were special banks that would redeem a traveler's checks, and then you would ca you would get cash, and so you had to kind of um, those were usually only in a larger city, and um, then you would carry you know the cash around f until you made it to the next big city, and you made a special trip to you know a big bank um, that. So that worked pretty well at that time, um, and uh, the amount of money being I was spending was not very much, and so you know I maybe carried a couple hundred dollars worth of cash in the local currency at one time, um, and and you know that was the way things were probably through the eighties, um, uh, and and you know. I, I carried American Express traveler's checks, which I bought before I left. Um, and so you had, to, you had to pace yourself out um, to make sure you weren't caught because it was still a bit of bureaucracy, bureaucracy standing in line, waiting, talking to, going to three different tellers. You know, <laughs> it, was a, it was a little bit of a ritual. Um, and so luckily I, I never ran out of traveler's checks, um, but that that's something other – that's adventures other people had like that. Um, so for me, um, getting money was was okay. Just uh, going with traveler's checks. Getting mail was um, okay. So you're traveling around. There is no internet. There is no phone calls really. That's affordable. So the the system for communication was uh, you would go to an, get an aerogram in the local country with blue thin piece of paper that would fold up into its own envelope. So it was very light. And I would write a letter home, and then you would collect mail. You, you, you would tell people ahead of time that you were going to go to Burma and that they should send a letter to you at the post restaurant in Rangoon. And so um, at the main post office in Rangoon, there would be um, these trays and trays, just, just, just long trays of mail addressed to different people at Post Restant waiting for them to come pick up the mail if they ever made it. And you would just go through these things without any order. They were just, as they came in, they would just be put into this tray holding there and you would go through hundreds if not thousands of letters seeing if any were for you and you could write a letter to anybody in the world at post restaurant and it would just sit there i think maybe they would have a stamp and after a year or something they would throw them out i'm not sure exactly how that worked but um it would it would just sit there and, and until you came by to pick it up and you'd have to show id with your name I remember this era, and I really – my big internet – the start of my big international travels were at the end of both the Traveler's Check era and the Poste Restante era, which by the early 2000s were 
far less common. Um, uh, and I know that you're based on Asia Grace. During your tenure in Asia, you made it at, back to Iran and, and Afghanistan and India and other places. And I want to talk about those too. But while we have you sort of in your early days of travel, I'm curious to know that the value of a dollar uh, in these places and also how you came to deal with things like bargaining and purchasing things in a pla mm. in these places that probably didn't have fixed prices. So how far mm. did your dollar go for a hotel room and a meal, and how did you find the prices and realize the value of things as you traveled through Asia? Yeah, um, so the dollar went pretty far back then. I um, so So the one place that was an exception at that time was Japan, which was sort of known worldwide as kind of one of the most expensive places to travel during, say, like the 70s. It was it had this reputation, uh, and it was. Uh, for whatever reasons, their economic growth, the exchange rate, it was really tough in Japan. So in Japan, I had a very, um, uh, I guess, rustic solution. So I hitchhiked in Japan, to get around because while the trains were marvelous, they were just way beyond what I could afford. And it turned out that hitchhiking in Japan was like the ultimate hitchhiker's paradise for a reason I'll describe in a minute. So I hitchhiked to Japan and I stayed at the youth hostels, um, which were a great bargain, primarily because they offered an all you can eat dinner and breakfast for a few hundred yen addition and the all you can eat dinner and breakfast was basically white rice miso soup and a couple pickles and a, a boiled or no actually a raw egg in in the morning and so um uh that was enough to fill me and then there always the question was like finding a noodle shop for you know a hundred yen noodles in, in in the midday I, I could literally could not afford to eat at a normal restaurant what was 100 yen in dollars in that time mm, boy you know i'm i'm thinking i'm thinking it felt like it was maybe 50 cents back then 50 cents then i don't know what it'd be now okay um so so I was living on, you know, I don't know, maybe three or four dollars a day in Japan, um, which was expensive for me. <laughs> you know, I didn't have any money. In India and places like Burma, you know, back then you could live on a couple dollars a day. I, I was living on a couple thousand dollars a year, which included all my transportation costs and, and everything else. Um, so, um, so, so you could really go very, very far, um, with a few dollars if you were li willing to, to, you know, live at the level where, uh, you know, you, you'd have a hotel, which meant you had a bed that had a communal bathroom and no shower. I mean, it's like, it's, it's camping, um, which was perfectly fine with me. That's all I needed. Um, and so some, in fact, some of the places like in Delhi, uh, you were living in dorms. There were, um, there were, there were traveler dorms, um, because everybody then, if you didn't stay at a big fancy hotel, you were a traveler and you were a budget traveler and you were trying to save money. So dorms were perfectly adequate and kind of fun in some, in some ways, um, because that's where all the information was, you see. So um, you wound up going to these kind of communal places, um, not so much that you kind of wanted to hang out with other travelers, but because that's what the guidebook was. That's There were these little guest books, and people would sometimes post up, you know, where's the best place to see in northern Philippines? And there was this very th thin rarefied network of other people who had discovered this travel in Asia and Southeast Asia that it's, you know, now it's like a, almost a right, for, um, you know, it's like a rite of passage. At that time there was 
there was a really secret network of people who were discovering that they could do this. And so they would leave, you know, breadcrumbs, um, notes about, you know, where the, the, the household where they had, would, would, would accept travelers or the place you could actually get, you know, yogurt or something like that. And, um, uh, that's where that information was being exchanged because there were no travel books and there, of course there was no internet. And so, um, staying at these places was actually where you picked up all the tips about what to see and what was going on. I've actually heard there's some famous names from sort of the hippie trail era, which is somewhat concurrent with the time you're traveling. There's like the what's its name in Kabul and the pudding shop yeah. in Istanbul right. and the crown. In I Delhi. street. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So you were staying at these places. Yes. Yes. Right. And um, I kind of, you know, mm, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't identify quite with the that crowd because most of them were kind of like today. They're interested in kind of, I wouldn't say party, but they were, they were there to have a good time, cheaply, and. I was on assignment. I had given myself an assignment by that time to photograph. I was there working. I saw myself as a working photographer trying to reach these places and document them. And so I was traveling pretty hard, I would say, meaning that, you know, I was out all day photographing. I come back. I wasn't there, you know. I, you know, I never made it to go where people were on the beach. You know, they were looking for a place where they could hang out for two weeks on a grass hut, drink beer for almost nothing, and you know, have a great time, get some hash. I was, I was photographing. I was moving. I was, I was out all day trying to reach remote places, and um, so hanging out, coming into these little. Um, centers where there was um a scene it was like well you know that's not my thing but i'll get i'll get some information uh, i'll pick i'll pick up information which is um what makes it worth it for me i'm i'm curious to know about the other travelers that you that you came into contact with i mean this was you started the vietnam war was still happening i'm, I'm curious to know uh how you were received as an american and then uh Besides the hippie trail types, uh, who else you came across? If there were other people who were traveling similar to you, if there were aid workers or missionaries or, or other seekers that, that were not local but were also traveling. Because now these travel networks are very well established, but I, I presume yeah. they were very uh, very new and, and uh, rare back then. Right. So, so – um, the, the first surprising thing about these drifters and travelers, and, and we called ourselves travelers at the time, always in distinction to tourists. Tourists were the kind of thing we looked down upon. Um, tourists, you know, had guides. Tourists um, were in, you know, eating kind of Western food and stuff. But the travelers were the kind of people on the ground. And um, the surprise to me was that there was – the Americans were actually a, a minority, a small minority of the of the – the mix of nationalities that most were Australian because, because of the proximity and, and European because um, the Europeans could get to these places by taking a bus, by, by, by land route. So you didn't need uh, even to buy a ticket for the Americans hopping over the oceans was a psychological and, and somewhat of a, of an economic hurdle. Um, and so um, that meant, though, that the people who made it there were all interesting. At least, I mean, I would say of the English-speaking folk who made it there, they were they were going to be interesting because they're because it's like it's like the people who are at the South Pole. I mean, it just to get there, there's so many things that you kind of have to do out of the ordinary that everybody who arrives there is, is interesting in some capacity. Um, and so, um, but there was like in the subcontinent of India, there were a lot of French for reasons I've never really understood. There was really popular to kind of go to India and, um, uh, wander around with literally no money at all. Um, but you could take the green turtle 
bus. You could take the magic bus kind of like from London. You could take a double-decker bus. It was an adventure itself to see if you even made it. Um, cross, going across land for, you know, they were kind of run almost nonstop, run all night long. You sleep in the bus. And so for very little money, hundreds of dollars, you could um, arrive in, in India. And then once you're there or even uh, Thailand, um, it was very cheap. And so there, so there was um, a, a kind of – there were two types. There were kind of the people who were there and going to hang out and maybe never make it back. They were just sort of um, encamped because this was a um, – because foreigners were often exempted from local – Rules. They could kind of get away with a lot. There was still a little bit of white privilege at work in uh, most of these places. And um, this was kind of the, the easy life. And then there was the adventurer types um, that I kind of hung around with who were who realized that this was the bargain of the century and that um, with with a small amount of money and some gumption that they could – get to places that you previously needed an expedition level resources to reach. Um, and, um, and, and, and so, so the, these two types of folks were kind of traveling on the, at the same level of taking local buses, which were amazingly cheap. I, I remember taking a bus overnight bus from Delhi, I think it was. No, maybe it was, it was in Patna, in India, into Kathmandu. And I am sure that that bus was probably not more than $5. I mean, so basically it was $5 to go to Kathmandu, Nepal. And uh, I remember that morning coming, you know, crossing over. It was, we ran all night. It was an overnight bus. So you leave in the evening, and then it's like the next day by noon, you're you're rolling down through the Himalayas into Kathmandu Valley, and it was like it was like taking a plane to another, taking a spaceship to another planet for five dollars. It was just unbelievably cheap and unbelievably exotic at the same time. Now you you started sort of on the on the Pacific Rim it sounds like but this this journey ended up lasting several years and sort of encompassing Southeast Asia South A Asia parts of what might be considered the Middle East how did how did this trip expand did you expect it to last multiple years and 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 expand to all these other countries or did it just emerge organically out of the trip yeah, it emerged again. It was, it was maybe close to an, an addiction of sort. I mean, um, so initially I'm in Japan, as I said, in Taiwan. Well, then I'm in Japan, and then you meet a traveler who says, hey, you know, you can take a ferry, a f you know, an overnight ferry to Korea. And Korea is kind of cool. And it's, you know, this or that. And it's like, really? Wow. Well, Okay, I'm here. I need, you know, my visa is going to run out. If I go to Korea, I can get a renewal and come back to Japan. So I'll do that. And it's only, you know, a couple hundred dollars. I still have a couple hundred dollars left. Um, and so once you're, you know, like once you're in Thailand, it's like, well, we can go to Burma. Well, when in Burma, what about Bangladesh? Has anybody ever been there? And so there was this sense of like this, um, it's kind of like where you're walking out. And a platform appears underneath you, and then you realize that if you kept going, you know, the more, the further you went, the uh, the more and more choices and opportunities you were presented with that you didn't even know um, you could do before. And so it was this matter of this kind of emerging network where you're meeting people who had just come from somewhere else, and their tales would convince you that you just had to go as well um, and that you could. Um, so at one point, of course, I ran out of money and there was two kind of general choices at that time. 
Um, there were a couple places around the world, like Taiwan, a little bit in Japan, some places in um, Iran, um, other, other, a few other places around the world where you could get a job to earn some money. And that job usually was teaching English. And amazingly, um, people who could barely speak English from my perspective, you know, from other countries in Europe, were getting jobs teaching English because compared to them, they were fluent, even though they were hardly fluent. Um, and of course, as an American, that was, it was a very easy thing to do, and a number of people did. But, but I kind of calculated that I could earn more in a few months back in the U.S. Flying back, working for a few months, and then going back would give me more money despite the, the plane ticket. Um, and so because I, had, I could do photography, and so I, there was a, a place that would hire me at a minimum wage kind of thing, and I could just make more money um, living at home in those few months than I could in um, working in Taiwan or, or Japan. So that was my, my solution. And um, except when I got to Iran – uh, later on, much later in the 70s, where um, I got a real job um, with with a driver and everything, um, and, and I could really earn money. But that kind of blew up my face because of the um, because of the revolution in Iran. But but so 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 um, you know, working was an option in this network. Um, where you could renew your resources, um, and other people did import export stuff. There was arbitrage um, at that time. Again, this you know before the days of Cost Plus and all these other boutique importers, um, there, there there were there were a lot of people who would kind of finance their travels by bringing back Thai silks or something like that that um, made enough of a they could charge enough of a difference. And again, the, the amount needed was so small that they would actually finance ongoing travel by bringing back things that, you know, you could certainly order, uh, find almost anywhere in America today. Now you were in Asia more or less full time from 72 to 1979. Like how many times did you go home? During that time, like how often were you going home to, to do this side work? Uh, I did it twice, and I think I was there for six months or so. Okay. Now, were you during this period? Did you mostly travel alone, or did you have travel companions? No. Um, I mostly traveled alone, except I did travel with my brother. I have a number of brothers. He was my closest brother, one year away. He was a fisherman in Alaska who did salmon. Um, salmon fishing, but it was seasonal. Um, so he would fish in the in upper inlands up near Sitka um, during the summer, and then he would travel the rest of the year. Um, and he he did far more traveling than I actually did. Um, but we did travel twice. We did travel twice together. Uh, including a trek up to Everest Base Camp, Base Camp and beyond. And we started to do a trek across the center of Afghanistan that was interrupted by a coup there. We were actually arrested and, and exported out of the country. Um, so, um, so those were relatively brief times, but most of the time I was traveling by myself and I always have to qualify that because um, there were there were certain general drifts in routes where it was almost hard to escape from traveling with another person for a while, just because uh, the general routes were were parallel. And um, so I so there were times when you know I'm remembering um, uh, a couple places in. Um, in Nepal on a trek where, you know, I'm, we're sharing the same route together, but it was kind of an emergent 
travel and then you know we're split at, at the end of the at the end of the trek um so did you have a love life during this time or were you sort of a steely-eyed loner yeah no i was a steely-eyed loner i had uh, no time <laughs> for that kind of thing um yeah i mean i was moving most i, I was not i was very rarely in a place for more than two nights uh, and then I was on to the to the next place, and that's it, it wasn't comfortable or fun for most people. Um, and um, but you know, I did. There actually, that's not true. I did ha- travel with a girlfriend in um, India um, for a period of time. Someone I met in America early on um, went to Kashmir actually. And so there was, I, I, I correct myself, there was, there was a period of time where, um, and we stayed on a houseboat that was um, quite nice. Um, so that was a, a, a brief period. But, and that was lovely, uh, the house, a houseboat in Dondal, like in Srinagar, um, is, you know, I, I wasn't, I was moving during the day, but I wasn't moving. So that was, that was a little bit more, civilized i would say was the traveler seen mostly guys or were there women traveling the world in large numbers as well from it's a good that's a good that's a good question there were primarily guys in that in the parts of asia that i kind of gravitated to there were definitely mostly males um and occasionally there would be couples uh, that was not uncommon, and it was very uncommon for a single gal to be traveling. And you know, they re- they seem to be doing fine um, in the Southeast Asia part. The closer you got to, you know, India, Pakistan. Well, India was was very common. Pakistan, not so much. In Iran, you know, in, in the mini that that was less so. Turkey, places like that. Um, Southeast Asia, India was not uncommon to have single women traveling um, into, you get into Nepal, into um, uh, other places, um, Nepal, I mean, was in the Philippines, um, later on, you know, Indonesia and Thailand, that, there were still, I would say, predominantly male, single males. Another 101 question here. Uh, what did you bring with you, and how did your attitude mm. towards packing change over the course of this sojourn? Yeah. So I was photographing there the first time around with film, 35 millimeter film. And my backpack, uh, I left with 500 rolls of film in boxes. They were still boxed. Um. And I had a change of clothes, and that was it. Wow. I, I, that was literally. I had. A, I, I don't think I had another pair of pants. I had one. I mean, I had like a change of like shirts, and um, I had a down jacket and a sweater or something. Because the thing about people don't realize is, even those tropical countries, if you have any altitude at all, it can get cold, and in the winter. Places like India can be freezing. So um, uh, I, I literally – I didn't have very much other than that. Um, and actually, my brother and I, I remember now, we, another place we did travel together was Sri Lanka. Um, and we, when we went to Sri Lanka, this was uh, to your interest in, in um, no, no backpacks. We, we um, left our backpacks and took just a day pack, didn't take a sleeping bag, I had a sleeping bag too, sorry. We didn't take our sleeping bags. We didn't take our coats. We just had a little backpack, whatever we could fit in it, plus my camera gear. I had a small amount of film. And we tried um, traveling around with just day packs, um, which was a lot of fun um, because we could jump off and off buses really quickly, stop if we wanted to and, and not have to. Uh, I don't know, take the luggage down from the top or it was just a lot easier with um, 
a, a backpack on, <clears throat> excuse me, a day pack. And so um, I, I, I had remarkably little stuff, um, you know, I had cameras, I had film, and a change of clothes. Did you resupply as you went, or did you find yourself getting clothes during your USA trips? Did the clothes fit you in Asia? Well, I lost a lot of weight, so they were very. Uh, yeah, actually, the, my 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 shirts were from my other brother who was a uh, in the Air Force. They were like linen, short sleeve linen shirts, very rugged, and they lasted a long time. Um, my pants were in shreds. I was a total disgrace. The the natives were just completely bewildered by people like us who obviously had enough money but dressed in rags. And whereas most people in the developing world, if they have any money at all, they're going to spend it on nice, looking nice. And, and it's, I mean, they really are, disgrace is the right word. They are just deeply embarrassed looking like rags because it says that you're, poor and obviously we're not poor but we're dressed like we're poor and um it was very very confusing to them um but uh, yeah i had jeans that had holes in them and patches <laughs> i literally i literally would patch sew my own patches onto the blue jeans i mean they look kind of it's like the cool thing now but again that was it was not it was not cool at the time it was just poverty how were you received by people? Did you feel like you, you made friends and were welcome in places, or did you have experiences where you felt like there was a, a distance between you and, and your host culture? You know, it, it varies tremendously. Um, I, I, I think people respond as, 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 as a mirror of your own relation to them. So, so um People who are gregarious and make friends easily and like to hang around and spend time um, had no difficulty in making good friends. I was I was civil and polite and never had any problems whatsoever. Or I shouldn't really say that. I had very few problems. Um, was always well treated, but I didn't intend or I, 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 did, I wasn't slowing down enough to really make friends. I did befriend some people. Like again, thinking of the houseboat in Kashmir, I became, I really kind of liked and became friendly with the owner of the houseboat who was a Sufi and took me to a couple of Sufi um, prayer things that they did in, in Kashmir. And so, so when I slowed down enough, you could get close to the natives. When I was moving fast, um, I wasn't giving enough time. But I generally, I mean, there are a couple of little places in the world where, you know, people just def do not want tourists or travelers. And they made it clear. But by and large, it was not a, it was not a problem. And it was certainly always reciprocated from whatever kind of um, good vibes you were giving out would come back. Did you ever have negative experiences in terms of extended sickness or, or crime or other dangers where you felt like you were sort of in a situation you didn't want to be in? So I would say in, in oversimplifying in general terms in, in Asia overall, which is a big place and lots of diversity that there was very rarely any uh, threat to your personal bodily integrity or safety. You know, it's, you were unlikely to be murdered or hurt or abducted or stabbed. Um, but getting things stolen, getting pickpocketed or getting scammed out of something was always kind of um, an ongoing thing. Um, and uh, there were plenty of stories and that was, that was a, that was a real risk. However, um, it's my observation, like pickpocketing, you, that, that was a matter of, um, of being um, this vigilant and there were things you could do. 
um, being kind of maybe ripped off in terms of bargaining. We didn't get to talk about bargaining, but um, that was always possible and probably happened on a regular basis to some degree. And and for me, that was sort of um, some of the, uh, the price of admission, um, not trying to get too worked up over losing two cents or a dime. Um, but uh, I also noticed that people who the stories of people who got really seriously scammed were always because they were people who wanted to make a quick buck themselves or, or they, or they were trying to, you know, um, game the system in terms of, you know, uh, getting money changed on the black market or things like that. So there was, there was always like, if, if you, if you, which I decided, I decided I was not going to try and and do those things, and so I didn't get scammed in that way. I did have a, I did have my camera stolen three different times, and I did get them back three different times, which are wow. stories stories in themselves. Um, so that was so I was carrying around something very valuable. I was carrying around cameras, which in their were not expensive to in the U.S., but they were considered wealthy there and I had 500 rolls of film which most people didn't know um, I actually traveled around throughout Asia during the 70s coming back into the US crossing many borders I had 500 rolls of film well I started with 500 rolls of film which was in brick in cellophane bricks which was incredibly valuable but I never ever the entire time the entire decade ever had anybody look inside my my, my backpack including coming back into the U.S. I was never examined. I was just, I had, you know, I was a kid with long hair and a beard and ragged clothes and probably smelled. And it was like, they didn't want to look inside my backpack. Uh, you know. So anyway, so um, uh, going back to the question of, of, um, of um, uh, I forget what the question was, actually. I uh, well, just just well, cr crime, uh, yeah, crime uh, yeah. danger, sickness, um, you know, sickness, even poverty. Sickness was, sickness was uh, uh, actually a real risk. Um, I got two intestinal diseases. I got giardia in India, which I self-diagnosed um, and self-treated. And so the other thing about that part of the world, particularly when I was traveling, was – you didn't need a prescription to get any medicine at all. Um, and I went to the library. I went to a library and looked up and did some research to, to diagnose Giardia, which I treated. Um, and I later on got hepatitis um, in Nepal, which was not uncommon. And uh, the remedy for that is basically rest. And I actually lived in a hostel in Calcutta, India for a month while I recovered. Um, and so um, those, those, and, and people got malaria and, um, and worse. And so, and so uh, at that time, particularly um, uh, getting s sick, seriously sick, not just a little diarrhea, but getting seriously sick was, was a risk. And um, I, and the reason why I got um, hepatitis in is, is that wherever local people drank the water, I drank the water, and I still do, by the way. I mean, it's like if locals are drinking the water, I'm drinking the water. If locals are eating, I'm eating. Um, so uh, that's, you know, that was just what I was doing, um, and. Uh, I didn't get anything worse than that, um, and generally, outside of that, I was pretty healthy. And um, you know, even today when I'm traveling, I don't get intestinal stuff because I'm—I don't know—I I, I try to keep my microbiome uh, microbiome pretty robust by eating and drinking wherever I go, and I go and. Still going to Asia, and that's another story. Right? I'm still traveling all these places, and I'm still drinking locally when pe when other people are drinking water locally. Yeah, it sounds like you were really traveling within the local economy and sort of 
patronizing the same sorts of businesses that local people patronize. Did your travels in Asia, Asia ever dovetail or overlap with a more formal tourist infrastructure? Were there, were there places where suddenly you were in a Taj Mahal type place and you were around a lot of Europeans or were you really, really traveling uh, in local economies the whole time? Uh, yeah, I was totally, and, and again, it was not by choice. I would have much rather stay in a nice place, but I simply didn't have any money to do so. And I would intersect occasionally, you say, at the Taj, or uh, it, there was also very noticeable in Nepal in the trekking because I didn't, you know, I'm trekking in Nepal and I'm I have a backpack and I'm by myself, and they have porters and guides, and they're you know a lot of gear. And they're paying a lot of money, and I'm staying, you know, I'm staying at the Chai Khanas, I'm staying at the the inns, the tea inns, and where you get to sleep free if you buy dinner, a dalba, a, a um, rice and lentil dinner for two dollars, they let you sleep upstairs uh, for free, and. The alternative was they're on these, you know, mountain travel expeditions with porters and and guides uh, carrying their gear. And, and um, I just noticed that the people who were on those things, uh, they were moving very fast, even faster than I was. And um, they would kind of look wistfully at people like myself, you know, hanging out going a little bit deeper and and they actually they would sometimes say you know i wish i had enough time to do what you're doing so they had more t money than time and i had more time than money and um these days i uh, i'm in the reverse as i have probably more money than time and i you know i i, I say that of the two it's much better to have more time than money um You'll, if in terms of traveling, you'll you'll have a much richer experience if you have more time than if you have more money. Yeah, it feels like that's something that still holds true, and you still have. I've been on both sides of that time versus money divide, uh, and you still have places where the budget, uh, low budget, slower travelers will intersect with the big budget, uh, week one week travelers, and it's sort of an interesting energy that comes out of that. I'm yeah. curious. I'm curious to know. You know, you brought a camera. Uh, which was certainly part of your intellectual journey and your artistic journey during this time in Asia. Did you also keep a journal? One and two, did you did you find and read books along the way? Were you reading maybe books from the Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim tradition or novels or other things like that? Yeah, so um, no, I didn't keep a journal, except for in one rare exception when I um, did a long trek uh, in Nepal up to uh, Muktinath, um, near um, Mustang, for some reason I decided to keep a journal because I actually walked from Kathmandu then to Pokhara and up, which was along a part of the trail that had already been abandoned because of um, the first highway. And, and I don't know why, but I did keep a journal at that time. For me, that was just, I don't know, it was as close as I had ever been or believed I would ever get to kind of um, going into a really unknown place. Um, but normally it did not, much to my, I guess I would say regret. I wish I had, but I didn't. Um, and reading, I had a um, New Testament with me that my missionary friend had given me, and I, or even a Bible maybe at one point, and I would read through that waiting, while well, I was waiting on buses. Um, and then I would just kind of, I, I would buy a, a paperback, usually a history of, the place I was in, I was kind of like, I was ne I've never interested in history at all. As a kid, I kind of, I would say that I hated it. But when I was in a country, I suddenly became very interested in the history of that place. And I c probably couldn't read it before I was there. And kind of after, I'm not that interested. But while I'm there, I'm really interested in it. So I would try to, to, I would find something in a bookstore or tourist shop about that place and I would read that um, and I didn't really read much else besides that um, I was literally every any daylight hours I was photographing and then at night I was collapsing um, so uh, 
I, I, I didn't get as much reading done as, as you might imagine over that time. Well, I want to get to the, the photographs you took in a second, but uh, one other curious thing that occurred to me, um, did you pick up any languages or become fluent or semi-fluent or passable in the languages of the countries you visited? So I, I arrived in Japan because I found a way to take a freighter. A fr uh, I went down to the docks of Kaohsiung in Taiwan, and I – you know, with very little language at all, found a captain of a boat going to Japan to take me to Japan because, again, I had very little money. And on that boat, I had I had a Japanese language book. So it was, took a couple of weeks to get there. And um, so I, I, I had what I called survival Japanese. I had barely enough to ask how much something costs, count, you know, that kind of stuff. And I had um, survival Hindi, which was useful in India and in Nepal. And I learned, I was learning Farsi because I wound up working in, in Iran and I was taking Farsi classes. So I had kind of survival, and, and I mean like really low level counting directions Yes, no, all, all those kinds of things. You know, the kinds of things that may be in the back of a Lonely Planets guide book just to be able to survive. And that's as far as I got. Um, um, and at that time, that they were extremely helpful. Um, less so now, but um, Chinese, I also uh, have survival Chinese. So I had survival Chinese, some survival Japanese, survival Hindi, and survival Farsi. Okay. Now you, um, f photography was a huge part of this, this, uh, this entire trip and, uh, that eventually led to Asia Grace. And one thing I mentioned before that there was a lot of similarities in your Asia Grace photos to sort of a national geographic sensibility. I've also seen, you know, your photos from more recent Asia trips. I think there's a 2014 trip that I saw some photos of. And then I also, on Instagram, I see photos of travelers who go to places like Asia. And there's a certain timelessness to the images that people seek, that basically these 1970s images that you have in Asia Grace are sort of the, the same trophy images that people are seeking in the age of smartphones. Yet I know from experience that for every person in a colorful traditional costume, uh, there's going to be 20 people in India or Thailand, uh, you know, talking on smartphones and riding mo motorcycles and wearing Nikes. So I'm curious to know how purely traditional were things in Asia in the 70s? Were you, did you find yourself having to sort of edit out transistor radios and blue jeans, or was it really that much cut off from the West? Yes. So, so, um, you're right. My um, my photographs, even at the time, focused on traditional things, and um, you could almost say they were kind of romantic in that sense. Um, and so um, there were certainly the encroachments of modern life happening um, everywhere in the world, even at that time. Um, but there were also plenty of places like say northern Afghanistan or Kathmandu where um, it was possible to pretty easily see and capture a scene where very little had changed in centuries and then there were other parts of the country um, you know there were certain parts of say Kabul Afghanistan that would start to have you know plenty of modern things and so um, what's changed is, is that those little, those areas that that were very traditional have become smaller and smaller and more and more tiny corners, um, and in some places like China, almost disappearing entirely. Um, and I, at the time, you know, wanted to capture that, um, and so I would go to those places where there was less of that development, and so my so those pictures were kind of easier to make then. And now they're harder to make. And in fact, they are very, very selective 
shopping in the sense that, um, as, as you say, most of that world doesn't look like those images at all. Um, and, and they are, they're authentic in a sense that I don't stage things. They aren't staged. I don't even give directions. I'm just capturing, but they are increasingly, um, rare views and the the normal the typical view is increasingly similar around the world uh, um, the development you know the the big buildings the kind of fast foods and, and this is not something that's an american whatsoever this is this is international so um so i'm i did a book for tash and i'm working on another book um some of the newer images that you mentioned of places that I had in Asia that I hadn't gotten to the first time around. And I'm looking for very kind of similar things, very traditional things. Uh, and I call this book Vanishing Asia, and it's the things that are disappearing. The, uh, and then there is kind of like a little uh, a sequence I've noticed about the disappearance. So the first things to generally disappear are costumes, uh, what people are wearing. So uh, the, the, the most common technology in the world, even I think – beyond a steel knife is a cotton t-shirt hmm. um which people don't make and they don't make knives they're they're, they're bought um and so um cotton t-shirts jeans are one of the first things that come in so native costume is the first to go then um uh native uh architecture is next um food is among the last to go, um, you can often find kind of traditional food in a very, very modern looking place where people are wearing blue jeans. Um, and language is probably the very last, but those are all shifting. But costume is, is the first. So I tend these days to, I, I often like to go to places where there's still some native costume left um, and native architecture. Um, and those pockets are, are smaller and smaller. Again, the people wearing them are authentic. They're, they really do wear this, not just for festive things. This is part of their identity. But those kinds of places will disappear. And I, I'm not nostalgic about it. I, I completely understand uh, what's driving it. I'm, I, you know, I'm not going to try and stop it. Uh, if, uh, there's... The reasons for it, the dynamics are huge and unstoppable, but I just enjoy seeing it and capturing it while it's here because someday they will be gone, and I, and I like to have a record of that. Yeah, you know, one thing that really struck me about Asia Grace was were your pictures of Korea because I lived in Korea for a couple of years. I, I taught English. Um, like many people, uh, like many Asia expats of my generation did. And that uh, the Korea images that you captured in the 70s were super rare when I was there in the 90s. And, you know, I came back to Korea, I think the last time I was there in a professional capacity was in late 1998. I came back in 2006 and things had advanced so much that I hardly recognized my own neighborhood in Busan, in the second biggest city in, in Korea. Uh, and so it's just interesting to hear you categorize what kinds of things change over time. Now, I'm, I'm thinking logistically, you traveled with 500 rolls of film. Were you developing them on the road? Were you sending them home? How were you archiving them and keeping track of them? Did you just come home and sort through them later? Or were you somehow indexing and keeping track of everything that you were working with in real time? Yeah. So I was, I was again. I, I didn't keep a journal. And I didn't even keep notes about where I was. Although I did have a map that um, I traced my uh, travels on. But it was, it was. Uh, I would say it was, it was a mistake not to be more thorough in my note taking because there are photographs where I am just not sure exactly where they were taken. Um, and the the way that I worked was. Um, I um, I mailed back um, my uh, film as I finished them. I would put them in kind of boxes of maybe I don't know twenty or thirty or you know a a um, 
a, a, a sizable box. And, and I was shooting at the rate of about um, two rolls a day, which was 70 images. And um, at that time, in the early 70s, when I first started, people people's jaws were dropped to the ground when I would tell them about I took 70 pictures a day because they just simply could not imagine how you could take that many pictures because they in their own lives had a brownie camera and like our family um, I looked at some of these images they would do a roll of 24 in a year mm. you would get pictures of um, Easter and um, uh, 4th of July and Halloween on one roll <laughs> you know it was like and so the idea of taking 70 day was considered outrageously extreme, just radical, just crazy. Um, so I would, I would take all those films and I would mail them back to my house, my mom and ask her to put them in the freezer. So she had these frozen. I didn't have enough money to, to, uh, to develop them. I'd have to come back and then during my time of working, I would be earning money. And the first thing I did with the money was to pay for the development of the, of the film so, so there was a really, really long feedback loop of when I took a picture and when I actually saw the picture. It could be a year or more. And so first of all, that's a really bad way. I mean, that's a horrible way to, to do photography is where you don't get to see what you're taking. Again, imagine you're doing a phone, but you never saw any of the images. Were you getting it right? And the other thing was these were all manual cameras. There was no automatic anything. You have to set the exposure. And so the question I always have is, is my camera even working? And so every, I think, couple of months, I, I bought a roll of black and white film, which I could get locally, and I could have it processed locally. And I would send a roll of black and white film, through, I had two bodies, through each of my bodies, just to make sure that they were still working correctly. Because I hated the idea of photographing and the camera's not working. How would I know? Um, but the rest of the film I would send back and then many, many months, years later, I would have it developed when I had enough money to pay for it because it was very expensive from my perspective to, to take a picture. And I think I did it some calculation recently that in today's money, it was equivalent of $5, a image, a shot Wow. for for the amount of money they had to pay for the film and to pay for developing it, it was close to about, in today's money, about $5 for each time I clicked the shutter. And um, so so one of the things was, was my photography changed when it went digital um, because there were a lot of things that I was kind of interested in and saw but didn't record because it was just so expensive. I had to think about, I had to, think about each time I press that shutter and um, uh, there were, there were just little details that weren't my main thing that I kind of didn't photograph that I do now when I'm photographing, I, I kind of collect, I have more of these collections of images of things that I wouldn't have spent the money in the past to do. And I kind of wished I had, but it was just too expensive for me to, to spend five dollars today, money on that—that that would almost be an interesting thought experiment to to the younger listeners in my audience to think if you had to pay five dollars for every smartphone photo you took, for every Instagram you uploaded, what would you point your lens at? And in fact, right. even some of the things you you made reference to are are probably actually this this world for for my younger listeners won't make any sense at all. I mean, you mentioned the brownie camera, which I think was one of the first point and shoot cameras yeah. from about 100 years ago. I grew up with the Instamatic, which is, I think, where we get terms like Instagram, you know, sort of this <laughs> retro thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was that guy. I remember that time. I would uh, I would take about a roll of pictures a, a year at home. And even when I was traveling in, in 98, 99, I don't know if I took more than 100 or 200 photos a year because it was right, expensive. Right. And I, yeah, I yeah. wasn't a photographer. And so... But yet I was yeah. a serious traveler. So that, that just underscores how extraordinary the fact that you were shooting 70 pictures a day was during yeah. the era, yeah. era when you were traveling. Right. And, and, and those 70s also include the fact that because I couldn't see what I was getting – 
Um, there was you, know, you have to do a little bit of bracketing. You have to take an additional one just because uh, it was not automatic exposure. You know, you, you trying to, in film is it was a lot more sensitive to getting the light right than a digital camera is. It had a far uh, more narrow uh, brightness range, and so um, uh, you know, for better or worse, a lot of the pictures I took are unusable because the uh, because I'm doing people on things that are moving very fast. It's it's you know the kind of 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 photography I do, kind of cultural capture, kind of anthropological almost. Um, uh, of mostly people, the conditions are changing, and getting them focused and getting them setting up the exposure correctly manually, very fast was difficult to do. So a, a lot of the images fail because technically they just um, were incorrect. But again, I don't know that. I'm hoping they're correct. And um, so there's there's additional pictures that you need to take just to make sure you get the basic exposure and focus correct. Did you, did you ever suffer heartbreak when a certain moment that seemed so perfect didn't turn out as well when it? Yes, yeah. all, all, all the time. Um, there were things, there were great shots that I just missed for, because I didn't have the automatic. Uh, although one of the things I will say is I, I did evolve like a lot of photographers back then, a kind of intuitive sense of what the lighting was because you're always setting it. You're there and you're setting the numbers and you're setting it. So after a while you can kind of, I would could kind of almost guess what that, what the lighting was and, and do that manually um even before i took the picture you know without looking through the camera oh this is you know f this is f2 at a 15th of a second um i can't do that anymore um but there were definitely you know great shots that are gone forever i will say though that the other interesting thing is is i had never lost a roll of film um, I was sending film through the local postal services and it sometimes would take months to reach, you would go by boat and it would reach the U S and, and, but I never lost a roll of film. I had some film that got heat, uh, stroke. I don't know what you're going to call it. It, it. it, um, when those kinds of Kodachrome get really hot, I had film that was stored in Delhi through the monsoon and it was, I, stashed you know and i didn't want to carry all that film all the way so i was going up to you know cashmere or somewhere i don't remember and i stashed stored film in a place in someone's closet and it was just so hot that it actually um, affected the color uh, but i didn't lose any any film and today shooting digitally i back up my images when i'm traveling i back them up three times on the road, I backed them up six times here, so I've never lost an image ever, um, in that sense of of having it there, but but losing track of it or losing it. Although there are plenty of ones that that I that I missed. How did your photographic sensibility affect your travels? Did it make you more extroverted? Did it put you into situations that you might have been too shy to approach? And did it inhibit you at times? Did it did it uh, put um, sort of a, a barrier between you and certain situations? That's a really good question. I um, what photography did was it made me get out. It 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 it, it was a lure, a carrot, to constantly get on and dead still today so so i w when i'm going to say i'll get up early and i will i'm a walker so i will walk for hours and hours and hours. it gets me out and gets me it, it's 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 my it's kind of like an excuse or my prod or my motivation to get out and see things and it has always that's always been the thing that it's a it's kind of it's it's a motivation to not just hang around somewhere, but to get out and see what's new, what I can see, and um, I've seen so much because of that. So it's a it's a way of forcing myself to go look and see things, not just look, but to see, to to kind of inspect, to to spend that time, and so that has been its chief thing. Is because I think without photography, I would just have been content to enjoy the the the, the place, but not to really. 
seek it out. Um, but at the same time, because of the kind of photography I do of mostly people doing traditional things, I actually stopped in the end for a long decade or more because it is the kind of photography I do is is slightly invasive. It's the only way to get the pictures that I want is to kind of steal them is is to I'm, I'm kind of a ninja photographer i can take pictures of people before they know that they're being taken uh, uh, so that they have a genuine authentic capture um there, there was very few times when i kind of worked with somebody um which is the proper way to do it if you really want great images you hang out with a family whatever and you you occasional times and i've done that it's very productive but it's also incredibly time consuming and I didn't, and I felt I didn't have that kind of time, but the other kinds that I was doing was ninja and I became increasingly uncomfortable with that approach. Like I was, I think over time in the beginning, in the early 70s, cameras were very, very rare. It was very unusual to see anybody with a camera of any sort. And I think over time, people became a little bit more wary of it, and I was trying to overcome that wariness, and that became, um, it was a little bit exhausting at times, just because I felt like, you know, I'm having to interrupt or invade them, that they don't really, they were increasingly uncomfortable with having someone walk up and take pictures of them. Um, and so um, that was, a, that's an issue. And, and now I, now I'm, when I do that, I kind of try to do a, a little bit more with permission, but not always um, because it does affect once you introduce yourself, once you have that, you, you really have to spend a lot of time before you become invisible again. And I try to do that more, um, to offset that, um, but it's I'm still a ninja photographer. Yeah. So you spent a, a huge chunk of the '70s uh, traveling Asia, very, very much uh, photography being a, a, very much a lens through which you uh, saw the continent. In some alternative future, you might still be there. Why did you leave? What was yeah. the end point? The honest truth was I had a religious conversion in Jerusalem on Easter, and I felt I needed to graduate. And I was on my way to Yemen, which I really regret. I never got to at that time. Um, and I just felt that I needed to graduate and in many, in many different ways. One is sort of, you know, again, there was a little bit of that kind of, um, I'm a little bit of uncomfortable with the, taking part and not giving um i came back to america to see my brothers and sisters I, that's when i rode my bike across the u.s and um i i was almost 30 by that time and i decided i should try and uh you know not just drift even though i mean i I had a choice. I, 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 could, I was already in talking. I was showing my stuff to National Geographic. They were interested. They were asking for slides. I could have kind of pursued that and become a professional. But I was becoming interested in more things. And not. And I didn't – I felt I'd done that for 10 years. I wasn't sure I wanted to do that for the rest of my life. So I, I, just, I made a switch to try and um, do a business. And – the business that I decided was, I, I, and I started to write. And what I knew more than anything else was how to do budget travel. So I started to write about things like that. I started, I had a col I got a column in a, pay, in a magazine. Um, I started a mail order company importing these little self-published books by Maureen and Tony Wheeler and this guy named Rick Steves and Bill Dalton and, you know, Ed Byrne and all these guys, they were, have little books that nobody knew about and you still couldn't find in most bookstores. And so I started a mail order catalog called Nomadic Books. Uh, 
um, where I was both selling them and reviewing them and, and offering travel tips and stuff like that. Um, and so I, so I got, a, I basically started a business, um, and that led to other things, computers and, uh, which I got to run the business. And so, um, Oh, my computer, my Alexa is <laughs> woke up because her wake up word is, is computer. Um, so I think I graduated in that sense. I decided to, um, go a different direction. I stopped traveling, eventually had a family and I didn't, which did not let me travel as in the ways that I was. Um, and so for Dec- a decade and a half, I was able to resist that desire to document. But um, as time went on, I started to travel with my family. My wife is Chinese. And these days, I've had business opportunity in Asia, and I always piggyback on additional travel. So I've, in many ways, am traveling almost, I wouldn't say almost as much, but I am covering almost as much territory now as when I was traveling younger. So I'm kind of been doing an awful lot of Asia travel in a very intense way, trying to document um, the past. So that, that moment of graduation, it was necessary and it was good and I'm glad I did it. And now I'm coming back to the same assignment but with more money than time and trying to document these last pockets of vanishing asia well i I have i have one more question about sort of how you uh, regard asia in the context of your life but just so my readers know um the the story of your jerusalem uh, conversion experience was a really terrific this american life segment that's gosh has been out more than 20 years now. So I'll put that in the show notes for my readers who want to hear the specifics of that. And the names uh, that Kevin was throwing out, um, <clears throat> Tony and Maureen Wheeler, uh, Bill Dalton, these are the, the early guidebooks. So, so is it safe to say that you sort of introduced Lonely Planet and Rough Guides and Moon Guides and Rick Steves to a, a greater American audience back in the 80s? Yeah, I mean, I, I was trying to, although my little business, Nomadic Books, had a very small... Um, circulation, but I would say I was part of the general trend and I was reviewing these books in the whole earth catalog. So, so I I was part of that general, um, awakening and getting them into the mainstream. Um, uh, you know, they all began as self publishers who, um, you know, didn't have access to uh, a lot of bookstores and went through the independence but they're so good that um, I, I don't think they needed me in any way, but I was certainly part of the initial vanguard that uh, that saw their value and was promoting them. And I got to, you know, to, to, to meet most of them at some point because it was a very small world at that time. And um, they were, they were hungry for whatever um, exposure they could get. So I didn't sell a lot of their books in terms of, the sales, but uh, I think I was part of bringing attention to them at a time when they were just self-publishing. It would be interesting to see the factors that went into how Asia changed after the 70s. One of a very influential book on me when I first became a travel writer was uh, Video Night in Kathmandu by Pico Iyer, yeah. um, who seems to chronicle what was happening in the 80s, which is is that, that the West and the East were meeting and, and sort of combining and, and sort of having this tentative romance within each other in a way that probably wasn't happening to you uh, as much in the 1970s, that uh, globalization, it feels like it kicked in in the 80s in, in a way that Pico Iyer was, was starting to chronicle around that time. Right. I mean, places like, well, of course, China was closed. And then a lot of... Um... Southeast Asia was still in a war mode and, you know, also closed. And then India was closed economically and culturally. I mean, they, they, they really resisted foreign investment, um, in a deliberate way, um, 
made it very difficult for that kind of all the all the forces that work now were were basically prohibited. So that was a whole subcontinent there, and then you know places like Nepal were were closed off for many years and recovering. So so there was definitely a um, an isolation aspect to all of Asia um, at that time that is no longer um, the case. In fact, I would argue it's soon to be the other way around, which is that together, um, you know, India and China alone are almost 3 billion people, um, which is three times the size of, of the U.S. Um, you know, almost two-thirds of the people on the planet live in this area, a majority of people. And so increasingly, as they develop in their own way, Asia is going to be the cultural center and the leader of, of the planet. And um, uh, this is going to be a big psychological blow to Americans and the West in general, which has seen itself for so for, for a century or more as the leader economically and culturally. And that's not going to be true in the next century. And um, that's a huge adjustment to make. Um, and so I go to Asia today still to capture the past and to see what the future is going to be because that's much more likely where most of that future is going to happen. And, and it's interesting that after all of your years in travel, you, you sort of came, went into a career, um, became involved with Wired Magazine, and people ask you about the future um, probably more than they ask you about your past in Asia. And this, this sort of leads into what's probably my final question, and I apologize if it's a little convoluted, <clears throat> but what you were talking about, the changes, you're able to recognize Asia in a special way because you spent so much time there. Similar, I'm sim in a similar way. I didn't spend quite as much time as you did. But I'm curious to know, given uh, sort of how you occupy the world professionally and personally, how did Asia affect your life? How did it change your life? And I'm also curious, you were in Asia when you were quite young, in your 20s. I was the same way. Youth is very much about becoming, about discovering yourself. So I'm curious to know what you discovered about yourself in Asia, but also how you have reconciled that becoming with who you are today. So if that's not too convoluted, if you could if you could riff on that a little bit. Yeah. I, I, it's no, I think you're 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 right on point. So um, let me try to answer the f second part first. H how did it? Change me. I think, um, you know, I, I grew up in a. I would. It's always hard when you're growing up to know what's normal because <clears throat> whatever you grew up with, that is normal for you, and you don't really realize if you're different until later on. But I would say my <clears throat> upbringing in suburban New Jersey was pretty. I was a pretty typical American, but um, I think because I arrived in <clears throat> Asia at pretty young in my twenties and went. Th through my formative years, as you said, becoming something, I think I, I became, I, um, I, I think what rubbed off on me a lot was sort of um, the um, sense of um, the value of, of a community identity, of the value of the social apparatus, the, the, the value of not just seeing yourself as an individualistic individual, but as finding that the group as a whole is as at least equally valuable and trying to honor that. So I think some of that rubbed off on me and made me much more inclined to um, not be just a cowboy American, but to um, have a little wider empathy range, a little wider um, identity as a whole, and also, you know, to make me more cosmopolitan, to to 
um, make it far more easier for me to identify uh, and and to 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 see nationalism as a um, as a, as a disease, really. And of course, that could happen with any kind of international experience. But um, in particular, I think with the Asian, in addition to um, helping me be more internationalist and globalist, I, I think it also um, bent me a little bit in the kind of directions of, of Asian culture in general. And the second thing that it gave me was, and changed me was, I, I attribute a lot of my optimism in even technology to the experience of seeing um, entire populations who are in very dire poverty. You mentioned Korea, you know, people living in grass huts in Korea um, as just one example that right before my eyes uh, lifted themselves and made themselves and remade themselves into some of the richest countries and places in the world. And, and I've just seen that. And, and so I have, and I spent so much time living in uh, these places without technology, uh, uh, living in the huts of, say, Nepal or the, on the, the Adobe buildings in northern Afghanistan where they literally have nothing more in the room other than some clothes on a hook and um, the, a pot to cook on. And to, 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 to see um, that movement as they acquired more technology and more choices to see and to feel what that does and all that that brings, including the problems, but to, to, to understand and to see again with my own eyes how in the net and that's a gain, that's a positive thing. I think a lot of my optimism about technology has come from the fact that I felt like a lot of them in their own journey, which they will talk about, you know, um, um, people living in India and, and Saudi Arabia and Iran and Pakistan, whose, whose parents and grandparents were dealing with starvation. And now they've, you know, now they're living in, um, modern luxury and that's within, they have experienced that themselves. And I think I have experienced that same trajectory and, that makes me as optimistic as they are. And so I think a lot of the optimism, the center of gravity of optimism has moved out of the U S and the West in some ways to Asia. And they're much more hopeful about the future than maybe the average American is. And I think I have, I think I caught that dose of optimism from Asia. Awesome. Uh, Kevin Kelly, thanks for talking to us about Asia today. Well, it's my Pleasure, Ralph. I, as you say, um, people ask about technology a lot, but I don't often get asked about um, the past in Asia. And as you can see, I have a lot to say. So it was a pleasure uh, remembering some of those um, times. Um, it was remarkable. I wish maybe I had been a little bit more aware of how fleeting that was. I had some sense, but maybe I didn't really, really believe that it would change as quickly as it did. And I am just so thankful that I had the opportunity to see the world that's soon be gone. Um, it was a real privilege. Yeah, it, it was interesting to listen to you just because so much of your experiences parallel mine, but mine were about 25 years later. And I can't go back either. You know, I can't go back yeah. to, to so much of what I saw and experienced when I was living there. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, these are your golden years. Someday people will look back to 2018 and said, my gosh, I wish I had been alive back then. And um, uh, there are things today going on that um, won't be going on in 30 years from now. So people should appreciate them at this moment. This moment, it's all we have, so it's easy to forget, but I think retrospective teaches you that lesson again and again. Yeah, so. for sure. Thank you for taking time. I really enjoyed it, and um, I wish you guys and your audience the best. Um, if you have a chance to travel, you will never regret it. Just Amen. do it. Amen. Amen. Thanks a lot, Kevin.
This has been Deviate with Rolf Potts. More about everything that was just mentioned, including links to Kevin Kelly's book, Asia Grace, and his Recommendo newsletter, can be found in the show notes at rolfpotts.com slash deviate. And as always, you can contact me with insights or questions at deviate at rolfpotts.com. This episode was produced by Justin Glow. Cedar Van Tassel does the music. Jan Futterman does the show notes. Thanks for listening, and I hope you tune in for future episodes of Deviate with Rolf Potts. Thank you.